This is the Bible in one year, day 153. Crazy love. Francis Chan's mother died giving birth to him. The only affection he can remember receiving from his father lasted about 30 seconds when he was on the way to his stepmother's funeral, age nine. When he was 12, his father also died. Francis cried, but also felt relieved. Francis is now a pastor. He and his wife, Lisa, have seven children. When his children were born, his own love for his children and his desire for their love was so strong that it opened his eyes to how much God desires and loves us. He said, through this experience, I came to understand that my desire for my children is only a faint echo of God's great love for me and for every person he made. I love my kids so much it hurts. Calling his first book Crazy Love, he wrote, the idea of crazy love has to do with our relationship with God. All my life I've heard people say, God loves you. It's probably the most insane statement you could make to say that the eternal creator of this universe is in love with me. There is a response that ought to take place in believers, a crazy reaction to that love. Do you really understand what God has done for you? If so, why is your response so lukewarm? The word zeal implies an intense or passionate desire. It can be misdirected, but as Paul writes, it is right to be zealous, provided that the purpose is good. Elsewhere, he says, never be lacking in zeal. Perhaps a good modern translation of the word zeal is crazy love. From Psalm 69. Save me, O God, for the waters have come up to my neck. I sink in the miry depths where there is no foothold. I have come into the deep waters. The floods engulf me. I am worn out calling for help. My throat is parched. My eyes fail looking for my God. Those who hate me without reason outnumber the hairs of my head. Many are my enemies without cause. Those who seek to destroy me. I am forced to restore what I did not steal. You, God, know my folly. My guilt is not hidden from you. Lord, the Lord Almighty, may those who hope in you not be disgraced because of me. God of Israel, may those who seek you not be put to shame because of me. For I endure scorn for your sake, and shame covers my face. I am a foreigner to my own family, a stranger to my own mother's children. For zeal of your house consumes me, and the insults of those who insult you fall on me. When I weep and fast, I must endure scorn. When I put on sackcloth, people make sport of me. Those who sit at the gate mock me, and I am the song of the drunkards. Crazy love for God's house. David loves God so much that it feels like anyone insulting God is insulting him. It's painful to hear people blaspheming God. The insults of those that insult you fall on me. David writes, zeal for your house consumes me. He was so passionate about God's house because that was the symbolic place of God's presence with his people. The message explains the zeal he expresses in these verses. Because I'm madly in love with you. These words are applied by the disciples to Jesus when he cleanses the temple. Out of zeal for God's house, Jesus drove off those who were trying to profit from a place of worship, taking advantage of those who wanted to draw near to God. David is passionate about not bringing God's name into disrepute. He does not want anyone to be disgraced because of him. Don't let those who look to you in hope be discouraged by what happens to me. He knows his folly and guilt, as I know mine. God, you know every sin I've committed. My life's a wide open book before you. David is concerned that this should not bring dishonor to God's house. Today, God's house, the temple, is Christ and his body, his church. There's nothing wrong with being passionate about the church. Be zealous to see God's name honored in his church today. 
Personally, I am inspired when I see a zeal for God's house, a passion in worship, a leaning in to the talks, an amazing welcome for every new person. Passion is inspiring and infectious. We need more crazy love in the church today. Lord, consume me with zeal for your name and your church. New Testament. Afterwards, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, also known as Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them, and they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, Friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, Throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, It is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment round him, for he had taken it off, and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from shore, about a hundred meters. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it, and some bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish you have just caught. So Simon Peter climbed back into the boat and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, a hundred and fifty-three. But even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, Come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, Who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread and gave it to them, and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, Take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, Do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, Feed my sheep. Very truly I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands, and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, Follow me. Peter turned and saw that the disciple whom Jesus loved was following them. This was the one who had leaned back against Jesus at the supper and had said, Lord, who is going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he asked, Lord, what about him? Jesus answered, If I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? You must follow me. Because of this, the rumor spread among the believers that this disciple would not die. But Jesus did not say that he would not die. He only said, If I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? This is the disciple who testifies to these things and who read them down. We know that his testimony is true. Jesus did many other things as well. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that even the whole world would not have room for the books that would be written. Crazy love for Jesus. 
This is the third time Jesus had appeared to his disciples, his fourth, including Mary Magdalene. Jesus appeared in the ordinariness of simple daily life. You do not necessarily need to do extraordinary things. Jesus meets you wherever you are. Peter is fishing. Six of the disciples join him. Jesus tells them where to catch fish and then cooks breakfast for them. Here is Jesus, risen from the dead, the one through whom the whole universe came into being, saying to his friends, come and have breakfast. The God who is revealed in Jesus Christ is life-affirming and such fun. When John recognized Jesus, he exclaimed to Peter, it's the Lord. Peter is so filled with excitement, enthusiasm and zeal to get to Jesus as quick as he can that he wrapped his outer garment around him for he'd taken it off and jumped into the water. Sometimes in our enthusiasm and zeal, we may do some rather crazy things. But what matters is the heart of love and zeal for Jesus. Peter's eyes were riveted on Jesus. All he wanted was to be with Jesus. In Jesus' conversation with Peter after breakfast, we see what it means to have this passionate love for Jesus. First, supreme love. Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? These may refer to the fishing gear or the other disciples, whatever it means. Jesus was calling him to make his love for Jesus, his supreme love. Our love for Jesus should be more than our love for anything else. Peter's zeal had not been without its obstacles. He denied Jesus three times. So Jesus gives him the opportunity to affirm his love three times. Three times, Peter tells Jesus, I love you. Second, sacrificial love. Jesus hints to Peter that his love and zeal for Jesus and his church is going to be costly. Indeed, it would cost Peter his life. Jesus said to him, when you're old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. This is the earliest evidence for the martyrdom of Peter by crucifixion. To be a follower of Jesus is a dangerous undertaking. When Peter is told this, he turns, sees John, and asks about his future. In this intimate moment with Jesus, Peter is distracted by comparison with John. Jesus politely tells him to mind his own business, something worth remembering when we are tempted to compare ourselves with others. Third, servant love. Each time Peter tells Jesus, I love you, Jesus tells Peter, feed my lambs, take care of my sheep, feed my sheep. Peter can only guide, nourish and be responsible for people if he loves Jesus passionately. Then Jesus says to Peter very simply, follow me. This crazy love for Jesus means following his example of love. Jesus showed the supreme example of servant love. He said, greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. He gave a very practical example of what this kind of servant love involved when he washed the disciples' feet. It's a commitment to help people, whatever we feel about them, to grow in their love for Jesus, not seeking to control them, but to liberate them. Jesus calls you to the same kind of love. Express your passionate love for Jesus by a passionate love for other people, giving yourself to take care of his sheep. Peter was willing to make Jesus the supreme love of his life. He was willing to pay the price and to follow in his footsteps of servant love. He loved the one who did so many things in his brief life on earth that if every one of them were written down, the whole world would not have room for the books that would be written. Lord, help me to love you as Peter did, to be zealous for you. Help me to feed your lambs, take care of your sheep, and be willing to pay the price, whatever it is, to follow you to the end. Old Testament, from 2 Samuel 2 and 3. Meanwhile, Abner, son of Ner, the commander of Saul's army, had taken Ishbosheth, son of Saul, and brought him over to Mahanaim. He made him king over Gilead. Ashurai and Jezreel, and also over Ephraim, Benjamin, and all Israel. Ishbosheth, son of Saul, was forty years old when he became king over Israel, 
and he reigned two years. The tribe of Judah, however, remained loyal to David. The length of time David was king in Hebron over Judah was seven years and six months. Abner, son of Ner, together with the men of Ishbosheth, son of Saul, left Mahanaim and went to Gibeon. Joab, son of Zeruiah, and David's men went out and met them at the pool of Gibeon. One group sat down on one side of the pool and one group on the other side. Then Abner said to Joab, let's have some of the young men get up and fight hand to hand in front of us. All right, let them do it, Joab said. So they stood up and were counted. Twelve men for Benjamin and Ishbosheth, son of Saul, and twelve for David. Then each man grabbed his opponent by the head and thrust his dagger into his opponent's side and they fell down together. So that place in Gibeon was called Helkath Azurim. The battle that day was very fierce and Abner and the Israelites were defeated by David's men. The three sons of Zeruiah were there. Joab, Abishai, and Azahel. Now Azahel was as fleet-footed as a wild gazelle. He chased Abner, turning neither to the right nor to the left as he pursued him. Abner looked behind him and asked, Is that you, Azahel? It is, he answered. Then Abner said to him, Turn aside to the right or to the left. Take on one of the young men and strip him of his weapons. But Azahel would not stop chasing him. Again, Abner warned Azahel, stop chasing me. Why should I strike you down? How could I look your brother Joab in the face? But Azahel refused to give up the pursuit. So Abner thrust the butt of his spear into Azahel's stomach, and the spear came out through his back. He fell there and died on the spot, and every man stopped when he came to the place where Azahel had fallen and died. But Joab and Abishai pursued Abner, and as the sun was setting, they came to the hill of Amma, near Gaia, on the way to the wasteland of Gibeon. Then the men of Benjamin rallied behind Abner. They formed themselves into a group and took their stand on top of a hill. Abner called out to Joab, Must the sword devour forever? Don't you realize that this will end in bitterness? How long before you order your men to stop pursuing their fellow Israelites? Joab answered, As surely as God lives, if you had not spoken, the men would have continued pursuing them until morning. So Joab blew the trumpet, and all the troops came to a halt. They no longer pursued Israel, nor did they fight any more. All that night, Abner and his men marched through the Arabah. They crossed the Jordan, continued through the morning hours, and came to Mehanaim. Then Joab stopped pursuing Abner and assembled the whole army. Besides Azahel, 19 of David's men were found missing. But David's men had killed 360 Benjaminites who were with Abner. They took Azahel and buried him in his father's tomb at Bethlehem. Then Joab and his men marched all night and arrived at Hebron by daybreak. 2 Samuel chapter 3 the war between the house of Saul and the house of David lasted a long time. David grew stronger and stronger, while the house of Saul grew weaker and weaker. Sons were born to David in Hebron. His firstborn was Amnon, the son of Ahinoam of Jezreel. His second, Kiliab, the son of Abigail, the widow of Nabal of Carmel. The third, Absalom, the son of Maacar, daughter of Talmai, king of Gishur. The fourth, Adonijah, the son of Haggith. The fifth, Shaphatiah, the son of Abitel. And the sixth, Ithriam, the son of David's wife, Egla. These were born to David in Hebron. During the war between the house of Saul and the house of David, Abner had been strengthening his own position in the house of Saul. Now Saul had had a concubine named Rizpah, daughter of Ayah. And Ishbosheth said to Abner, Why did you sleep with my father's concubine? Abner was very angry because of what Ishbosheth had said. So he answered, Am I a dog's head on Judah's side?
this very day, I am loyal to the house of your father, Saul, and to his family and friends. I haven't handed you over to David. Yet now you accuse me of an offense involving this woman. May God deal with Abner, be it ever so severely, if I do not do for David what the Lord promised him on oath, and transfer the kingdom from the house of Saul, and establish David's throne over Israel and Judah, from Dan to Beersheba. Ishbosheth did not dare to say another word to Abner, because he was afraid of him. Then Abner sent messengers on his behalf to say to David, Whose land is it? Make an agreement with me, and I will help you bring all Israel over to you. Good, said David. I will make an agreement with you. But I demand one thing of you. Do not come into my presence unless you bring Michal, daughter of Saul, when you come to see me. Then David sent messengers to Ishbosheth, son of Saul, demanding, Give me my wife Michal, whom I betrothed to myself for the price of a hundred Philistine foreskins. So Ishbosheth gave orders and had her taken away from her husband Paltiel, son of Laish. Her husband, however, went with her, weeping behind her all the way to Bahurim. Then Abner said to him, Go back home. So he went back. Abner conferred with the elders of Israel and said, For some time you have wanted to make David your king. Now do it. For the Lord promised David, By my servant David I will rescue my people Israel from the hand of the Philistines and from the hand of all their enemies. Abner also spoke to the Benjaminites in person. Then he went to Hebron to tell David everything that Israel and the whole tribe of Benjamin wanted to do. When Abner who had twenty men with him, came to David at Hebron. David prepared a feast for him and his men. Then Abner said to David, Let me go at once and assemble all Israel for my lord the king, so that they may make a covenant with you, and that you may rule over all that your heart desires. So David sent Abner away, and he went in peace. Crazy love be unity. With the death of Saul, Israel and Judah were divided. Abner called out to Joab, Are we going to keep killing each other till doomsday? Don't you know that nothing but bitterness will come from this? This cry has a very modern ring as we see the continued turbulence and division in the Middle East. The war lasted a long time. Then Abner sent messengers on his behalf to say to David, Whose land is it? Again, this is a question still asked today. Abner went on to say, Make an agreement with me, and I will help you bring all Israel over to you. Eventually this happened, and for a time at least, the land enjoyed unity. Disunity is so destructive. We see it in the Middle East today. We see it in the church today. We should be passionate for unity. Lord, I pray for a peaceful and just solution in the Middle East. Help me also to be passionate in pursuing peace, unity, and reconciliation in your church. Pepper adds, 2 Samuel chapter 3, verse 14 says... Then David sent messengers to Ishbosheth, son of Saul, demanding, Give me my wife, Michal, whom I betrothed to myself for the price of a hundred Philistine foreskins. So Ishbosheth gave orders to have her taken away from her husband, Paltiel, son of Laish. Her husband, however, went behind her, weeping, behind her all the way to Baharim. Then Abner said to him, go home. So he went back. I know Michal was legally betrothed to David, but I'm not sure this was the best pastoral decision. Her poor husband, Paltiel, seemed really upset. Michal wasn't consulted, and David hardly needed any more wives. He already had at least six. I think she would have been much happier if she'd been left with Paltiel.